you'll turn, turn to uh, Psalm chapter 66. We're going to look at verses 16 through 20. And as you're turning there, I want to try to remember an old fairy tale. Now, if I got it wrong, some of you kids can correct me afterwards, because I kind of went from memory from it, so I'm not sure I got it all right. But there was a story of a, a kingdom, and the young princess of that kingdom went missing. And for years and years she was gone. Well, the king and the queen desperately wanted her back. But over the years, young ladies would come to the castle and claim to be the long-lost princess. Well, the king and the queen just couldn't be sure if it was really her, but they knew that their daughter was royal. And she would know something that the common wouldn't know. So they would make a bedroom and they'd stack ten mattresses up. And on the bottom mattress they would put a pea. Now, if that young lady laid on that mattress, that stack of mattresses, and she felt the uncomfort of that one little pea in her mattress, she must be the true princess because she's royalty. Well, through all the years, none of the young ladies ever noticed the pea because it didn't bother them. They weren't aware of it because they were not of royal blood. But one day, a young lady came, and she claimed to be their long-lost daughter and like all the other ones, they took her to the room to sleep for the night and they put her on the mattress, but the pudding did not sleep because she was so discomforted by this little pea, ten mattresses below her, that she had to get up and tell them she could not sleep on such a bed. And to their great joy, it was the princess. She had come home and only she would know, only she would be able to realize that there was a pea in the mattress because she was of royal blood. Now what's our lesson here for us today as we look into Psalm chapter 66? I want you to envision that that little pea, ten mattresses below, is a sin. And your life is that stack of mattresses and you are laying upon that stack of mattresses. Does that little pea cause you discomfort? Let's read Psalm chapter 66, verses 16 through 20. Now, all the way up to verse 16, what David is doing is giving praise to God. He's saying, come, let us worship the Lord. He is wonderful. He has done great works. He's brought us out of slavery. He's taken us through the purifier's fire. Let's worship the Lord. Let's bring our praises to Him. And then David says... In verse 16, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me, and he hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. The lesson that we should have with the princess and the pea, using that example, is that we ourselves should have such a sensitivity to sin that it causes us great uncomfort, that it causes us deep sorrow. So the title today is, Are You Uncomfortable with Your Sin? Are you uncomfortable with your sin? And I want to use the example of what David is saying here. Does his sin affect his prayers to God? And David gives us a plain answer here that it does. But it's not the fact that you're a sinner. We'll get into that because we all readily admit right now, yes, we're all sinners. David has a different point here. But what I want you to think of as we're going through this is these couple of questions. How does that sin and your comfort with it affect your prayers? Does harboring of sin in your heart cut off your prayers from God? Or are you so aware of sin and your fight with sin that it causes your prayers to reach the throne of mercy? Now there's few prohibitions pertaining to prayer that we find in the scripture. But there are some, and David here plainly describes a condition where prayer would not be heard or it would be an ineffective prayer. 
his words here in verse 18 is, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. David is talking about regarding sin. Now, we all have our first point. We all have it. He is not saying that only the holy, sinless, faultless can come before the throne room of mercy. If that were the case, none of us would ever pray. No one would pray because it would be a futile experience. It would not do us any good. Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call the sick and the sinners to be saved. So we have to acknowledge that we're not talking about perfection and being without sin. What we're talking about is acknowledging sin in our life, realizing sin in our life, seeing sin in our life, and fighting against that sin in our life. It's talking about confessing the sins in our lives. Even Jesus gives us the example in his prayer when he says, this is how you should pray. Father, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses. Jesus is telling us right then and there that you need to pray often for forgiveness. Why? Because we're sinners. Because we have sin in our life. In fact, the more godly that we are, the more devout we will strive to be, and the more plainly aware of our sins we're going to be, the closer we draw to God. The more we commune with God, the more aware you are going to be of that pee in the mattress. And this comes through confession. See that the pee is there. The princess did not just lay on the mattress. She had to get up because it was so uncomfortable. She could not tolerate the sin. Can we tolerate it to the point that we begin to overlook a sin in our own life? That we can begin to get used to it. It's just a little lump in the mattress. I'm sure I can get past that eventually. Or does it continue to cause you deep discomfort? David readily confessed sins. Throughout the Psalms, we see David going before God, confessing his sins. Both the sins that he had acted upon, the sins that were in his heart, and even confessing of the secret sins, whether there's something hidden deep inside, or whether it's a sin that he wasn't even aware of that he was doing. He was aware of his sinfulness and his need to rid himself and to fight against that sin on a daily battle. But again, being guilty of sin does not disqualify you of the privilege of coming before God. It is because we are sinners that we should come crawling often back to the throne room of God, acknowledging our sins, confessing our sins, trying to rid ourselves of those sins. One of the marks of a true Christian is that you never stop fighting your sin. If you believe that you've gotten to a point where you no longer have to fight sin because you don't have it, you're in a dangerous spiritual position. We are all aware that we are sinners. And as sinners, we must do what? We must continually fight against sin. And it's not so much trying to win the war against sin. Jesus did that himself on the cross for us. But we are left here to fight a daily battle against sin that is ever-present. But are you getting used to your sin? Or does it still make you uncomfortable? Does your sin cause you sorrow? We're going to, we're going to come out with scars. We are in this fight against sin. It's going to hurt. Sin has consequences. And when we fight against it, sometimes we're going to be scarred. But that does not mean that we stop fighting against it. And say, you know what, it's easier to just let it go. It's easier to just forget that there's something in the mattress. I'll just try to scoot over here and sleep and forget it was there. I'll just get used to it. Sometimes it's hard. And sometimes when we start fighting that sin, we get scarred. We get hurt, but we continue to fight. We continue to acknowledge the sin. We continue to realize the sin, to regard the sin, as David 
says. Do we want to be comfortable with it and have God and my sins? I'm used to this one. That pee doesn't cause me that much discomfort in the mattress. Why can't I be the princess and sleep there? Why can't I have Christ and my anger? Why can't I have Christ and my greed? Why can't I have Christ and whatever the sin that we all so often want to hold on to is? Why can't I have them both? Charles Spurgeon says that the proud sinner wants Christ and his own parties. He wants Christ and his own lusts. He wants Christ and his own waywardness. But the one who is truly poor in spirit wants only Christ. And he will do anything and give anything to have just him. David acknowledges his sins as we should also. You know why David acknowledged his sin before God? It wasn't because he cherished his sin. It's because he hated it. David was miserable in his sins. And he hated his sins. And therefore he would go to the throne and say, God, I am a sinner and I need you to help me fight through this sin. It's an acknowledgement of our sins. That's what this regard means. If I regard iniquity in my heart, do you realize that it's there? Or are you overlooking your sins? There's a good example in uh, Luke chapter 18 of the publican and the Pharisee. They both went to the temple to pray. One did not see his sins. He overlooked every one of his faults. But the other could only see his sin. And you know what it caused him? Extreme discomfort and deep sorrow. And the one who recognized his sin, the one who had sorrow over his sin, the one who confessed his sin is the one who went home justified. But not the one who overlooked his sins. The one that overlooked it and refused to acknowledge it goes home living in his sin. Not justified means he is doomed. He is destined for eternal destruction. Because he does not acknowledge his own sin. But one went home justified. The one who knew he was a sinner and he hated that sin. He didn't overlook the pee in the mattress. He couldn't stay there because it caused him so much discomfort. Regarding iniquity in my heart, it simply means this. Do you harbor sin in your life? It means, do you see sin and you allow it to stay? Do you see sin and you give it a room in the home of your heart? Do you see a sin and you give it an excuse to stay in your life? That's what harboring the sin here means. Charles Spurgeon on this again, he says, if I cherish it, have a side glance of love towards it, or excuse it. The Lord will not hear me. How can He? Can I desire Him to connive at my sin and accept me while I willfully cling to any evil way? Think about that for a moment. I have this one sin that I refuse to let go because I've given it a home in my heart I have gotten comfortable with it. It doesn't matter what the rest of you think. I'm okay with this sin. And yet I'm going to go to the throne room of God and say, Lord, I want your blessing on me. While I still harbor this sin in my heart. Now, there's other scriptures that reflect this same sentiment here that the psalmist gives. That the Lord will not hear the prayer of David if he is regarding his sin as in his heart, if he's holding it in his heart with affection, if he cherishes that sin, God will not hear. Another one is Psalm 109, verse 7. It suggests that the prayers of the wicked should be counted as sin against them. John chapter 9, verse 31 specifically states that the Lord does not hear 
sinners. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. Now there's a difference. A sinner can still call out to God, an unrighteous sinner, and it is not heard. But the righteous are calling out to God like David did, and it is heard. What's the difference between those two? David, the righteous, knows he's a sinner and he hates the sin. And God hears his prayer. But the ungodly do not see their sin, do not acknowledge their sin. And if they cry out to God, he does not hear them. Proverbs 28 verse 9 says that the prayer of the disobedient or rebellious is an abomination to the Lord. It's disgusting to Him. He loathes the prayers of the rebellious. How about you? How about me? Do we have rebellion hidden in our heart through a sin to give up? Do we have rebellion in our heart Because we have gotten so comfortable and so used to a sin that we now begin to overlook it. Does sin have a safe haven in your heart? That's what Psalm 66 is telling us. That if we love it, cherish it, give it room, overlook it, refuse to acknowledge it, God will not hear your prayer R.C. Sproul on this verse stated, The very idea of a person trying to pray while still cherishing their sin, while holding on to a sin he is not willing to relinquish to the Lordship of Christ, cast a dark, dark shadow of doubt on even the validity of their sonship to Christ. Are we cherishing a sin? Now it's easy for us to say, no, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I don't do this. I've repented of this and I've repented of this. But do we have something, something in our heart that we know is wrong, but we've gotten comfortable with it? Just look at the examples that Brother Mike gave us this morning. Go through any of those examples. I found myself sitting over there feeling awfully guilty this morning. That there are some things I try to overlook. You know why? Because of my selfish interests. Because it's uncomfortable to deal with them. So I begin to overlook them. So I start to normalize them. Do you struggle with anger? Well, the excuse we used to always say in our families, well, it's our Irish temper. That is just a sinful excuse to not deal with our anger. Whatever the sin may be, and it's different for everyone. We each have different battles. We each struggle with different ones. But insert the one that you're harboring there. Do you acknowledge it? And does it make you uncomfortable? Does it cause you deep sorrow? Or have we began to overlook it? Or have you given sin a safe haven in your heart? We're To allow no hindrances to our prayers. That's what David is addressing here in in verse 18. He's saying, if I hold this sin in my heart, if I refuse to acknowledge this sin, even if I've gotten rid of all the other sins, if I've repented of all the other sins, but I've got this one that I hold dear and I hold to, just this one and everything else I'm doing is right, God will not hear my prayer Are you hindering your prayers to God by refusing to acknowledge sin in your life? There's some practical applications of this that Scripture gives us. I'll give you two. One is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, just mostly paraphrasing. It says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. How is that man's prayer being hindered? By not living with his wife in an understanding way? Do you know what the word hindered literally translates to? Cut off. 
If there's discord in your marital relationship and it's not dealt with and we begin to overlook it and we begin to normalize it and we as husbands don't live with our wives in an understanding way and we've gotten used to that and we've excused that, then your prayers are being cut off from God. Really? Over just not understanding my wife enough? Not living with her in an understanding way? Yes, says the scripture. Are you overlooking things that may not seem like a big deal to you? I know it may not be right, but is it that big in the grand scheme of things? Well, if you're excusing your sin, then yes. Yes, it is. Are you allowing it to stay there? Are you excusing it? Are you overlooking it? Then Peter is saying, brothers... If you are not living with your wives according as God has called you to do, in an understanding way, knowing that both of you are heirs of God's grace, and you're lording over her in an ungodly manner, and you're not living with her in a loving way that God has called you to do, and you know it, and you're okay with it, and you've gotten comfortable with it, then brothers, your prayers just may be cut off from the ears of God. That echoes exactly what David is saying here in Psalm 66. If your sins are not dealt with, if they are excused away, are you still going to try to go to the throne room of God and ask for His blessings on you when you willingly let sin reign in your heart? Another example is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24. Now this isn't talking about prayer, but it's talking about worship. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, you leave your gift there before the altar and you go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus is here saying that if there's unresolved conflicts in our lives, then even our worship may be blemished. If there is a conflict that you have, discord that you have with someone, and you know it, you've excused it, and you've allowed it to remain, and then we go before God to worship, even our worship may be blemished. Go and address the sin. Don't excuse it. Don't give it room to fester. Don't at first think it's uncomfortable and then start to normalize the sin in our hearts. First, we must address those sins. Then we come and offer our worship. Now, how does David here in this passage know that his his sin is not dwelling in his heart? How do we know the answer to that? Because David says in verse 19, But verily God hath heard me. He has attended the voice of my prayer. David knows that he's in a fight with sin. He is very well, he's a sinful man. But he is also very uncomfortable with his sin. He hates his sin. It causes him much sorrow. And he goes to the throne room and he asks God over and over, God forgive me. Of my sin. Going back to Psalm 51 when he had the affair and he had someone murdered, he goes to God and he says, Purify me, make me clean. What he does after that is important. He says, So that I can then teach your statutes to others. David's not going to go try to teach the statutes of God while he has unconfessed sin in his heart. He wants God to renew him, to purify him, to cause him to be clean again, to confess his sins so that then he is in a place where he can help others to fight against their sins as well. But David first acknowledges his sin and he confesses his sin. He was sensitive to his sin. He did not get to dwell in his heart, even when the temptations come, even when we falter, do not give it a dwelling room. Don't say, you are welcome here, sin. 
This can be your home. You fight it out of your home. You fight it out of your heart. Even when you come up bloodied and scarred, you continue to fight against those sins. And you do that by confessing them to God. You don't hold it inward and fight this on your own. Because you will fail fighting on your own. But God has given us something here now to help us fight against these sins. God has given us something to cause us to have discomfort. It is called the Holy Spirit. The great comforter has come to be with you now, today, to make you aware of your sin. To make you acknowledge your sin. And the Holy Spirit is not here to help you normalize your sin and get used to having the pee in the mattress. The Holy Spirit makes you sensitive to the pee in the mattress because now you are of the royal household of God and you cannot tolerate the lumpy mattress because you are of royal blood. You are of the household of God and the Spirit makes you aware and He makes you sensitive to that sin. Do not fight them on your own, but fight through the power of the Holy Spirit with you today. Fight with the Holy Spirit. He is on your side. When we petition something to God, and we have knowledgeable, unconfessed, welcomed sin in our heart, then we're petitioning God for more strength to disobey Him. When we harbor sin and welcome it and go before God and say, God, give me strength and bless me to continue to mock Your name. Brothers and sisters, we must, we must Acknowledge our sin and we must not normalize our sin and we must not acknowledge our sin. Just go into the example that Brother Mike used this morning of the four letter word. Well, everybody's using it. Then are we normalizing it? Have we made it okay in my heart for that to dwell since everyone else is doing it and it's become normal? Or does it cause you discomfort? Does it cause you sorrow? But what happens here in verse 19 is David is acknowledging that he's not harboring his sin in verse 18 and that God has attended the voice of his prayer and that God has heard him. And then David goes back and he doesn't say, God has heard me because I am so good at acknowledging my sin. No, he goes back and says, blessed be to God because He has heard me. He has not turned away my prayer, nor His mercy from me. God is full of mercy towards His people. God has His ears opened to the righteous, and He hears your prayers. God shows mercy to us by hearing our prayers. So just take this short example here. And answer those questions again. And realize, are you uncomfortable with your sin? Just as that princess in the pea, we should have that kind of sensitivity to sin. The closer we are, the slightest sin should cause us deep sorrow. And we go to the throne room of mercy, casting it to Him. Laying it at the cross of our Savior. Do not harbor it. Lay it at His feet. And cry out to God who hears your prayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we are sinful people. But Lord, it does not stop there. We are sinners saved by the awesome power of a mighty God. And Lord, you have given us grace. You have given us mercy and you have called us from a life of sin to a life of righteousness 